good to see you again. Each evening at precisely this time, we travel together. And I think that this evening, you're going to especially enjoy our journey because it's really taken right in your own backyard. We're going to go see Mount St. Helens. And en route, we're going to drive through some of the same country to get there. Would you just lean back, relax, and fasten your seatbelts tightly? We begin right now. Mount St. Helens. Peggy and I, at the time Mount St. Helens erupted, were doing evangelistic work in the city of Denver, Colorado. And of course, it made national news, it made worldwide news in just a matter of short hours. And so as soon as we were able to get back to the Pacific Northwest, we decided we would take a trip to go to see some of the damage, go to the area, shoot some pictures. We picked up my mother and our son Troy and made our way up first through northern Idaho, up through Coeur d'Alene, and this, by the way, is Lake Coeur d'Alene, and, and we may have a shot or two of Lake Ponderé as well. We crossed into Canada, there above Sandpoint, Idaho, and then we turned toward the west and moved across over through southern Canada, and then over about Brewster, Washington. Any of you know where that might be? Yeah, I thought so. Then we came back down south and uh, made our way over the mountains. When I show pictures like these, by the way, in, uh, in certain parts of the world, they just can't believe that we live in this kind of beauty. And indeed, we are very, very privileged, aren't we, you and I? These natural lakes, because generally when you see a lake this large elsewhere, the folks say, well, where's the dam? How deep is the water right behind the dam? And these are natural, and they're the re result of snow melt, and there's nothing else quite like them in all the world that I'm aware of. I remember we just dropped over the hill down in toward Wenatchee when I shot that picture, and there we'd pick up another buddy and then go over the Cascades and come down in and around the Toodle River. This is Mount St. Helens, of course, before the blast. That's Spirit Lake. Some of you have been there. How many of you, by the way, have been there to picnic or have a good time? My brother celebrated his wedding. He honeymooned on the shores of that lake, and he met the old character that managed the lodge there. You remember his name? Not the president, but Harry Truman. Exactly so. We'll say more about old Harry in just a little bit. One of the most beautiful places on the face of the earth. By 1979, the mountain was showing signs of coming back to life. In fact, the north face was early in 79 beginning to grow and bulge like a tumor. From time to time, the mountain would give off a puff or two of smoke and vapor and steam, and then she would quiet down, and, and then she would give another little bit of a puff and then quiet down again. There was the real danger that the thing might explode with an eruption that was uh, unknown in modern times in the United States, at least. And so folks with an interest and a fascination in volcanoes and volcanism came by the hundreds. Chief among them was David Johnston, who'd been studying the volcanoes up in and around Alaska and the Aleutian peninsulas. And so he came down and made a camp five miles from the summit on the north face of the mountains. He had a tent. He had a number of cameras that were automatically triggered any time there was either motion or seismic reactions of any kind. He would report to a radio station in Vancouver, a little puff of smoke, a little steam, and then he would give the hour and the time and document it in his own journey, a uh, journal rather, and those reports were going all across the United States, and they were also simultaneously going by satellite feed clear around the world. Tourists began to flock to the area, many of them from the state of Washington, many others from the Pacific Northwest, but lots of them from elsewhere across the United States, and several from far, far away, as far away as New Zealand. Folks wanted to be there if something spectacular was. When history is made, you want to be a part of it. You want to be nearby where it happened and when it happened. Any of you folks ever been in a time or place where you got to see the president? Any of you ever seen it? Yeah, a president of the United States? You'll always remember that. And so folks teamed in here, flocked in here, and began to set up camps. Now, 
By the middle of May, the federal government had put a cordon down around the base. Yes, before the middle of May, by the first of May, the last of April and the first of May, the federal government had put a cordon around the base. And they were allowing to go in and out only the folks who lived inside that perimeter. And also they were allowing the loggers to go in to cut the trees and trim them up, load them on the trucks and take them down to the sawmill over around Longview, Kelso, Washington. During this period of time, you'll remember old Harry Truman, that salty, crusty character, became something of a folk hero. The news people from around the world were fascinated by him. They evidently hadn't met folks from the Pacific Northwest in number, but he was quite typical, I think, of a lot of the folks who lived back in the mountains and the valleys of the Pacific Northwest. He had a facade uh, that was, that was, um, that was hill country, mountain country, and he had a sense of humor that was wry, and he had a vocabulary that could cause a sailor to blush from time to time. <laughs> well, there's a little puff, and there's a little plume, and then she would quiet down, and folks, when she would puff like that, would vacate and make sure they were beyond the perimeter, but then after she quieted down, they would come back again. This is a bit of the bulge on the north face. But if we're back four or five miles, surely we're going to be safe because traditionally when a volcano explodes, and throughout history this has been the case, she blows right out through the top. The cone, you know, it's like an inverted ice cream cone. It's larger down at the bottom and then becomes more narrow. And without exception, they blew out right through the top. And so folks were quite sure the same thing was going to happen here. But of course, we know now it would not and it did not. There he is, old Harry Truman. And the television people and the reporters would gather around him. Aren't you afraid, Harry? I ain't afraid of nothing. Well, I said I've hand wrestled mountain lions. I have with my bare hands killed bears, and I'm afraid of nothing. Well, what if the mountain blows? If she blows, I've got a fifth of Jack Daniel's whiskey in the cave, and I'm going to be fine. I'll ride her out. Those who knew him best said that he did have a sense of fear. He did have uh, some trepidation, but there was no place in the world he would rather live or die. He'd spent most of his life here in the shadow of the mountain and on the shores of Spirit Lake, and he'd buried family members in a little plot there, and he was not about to leave. I want to tell you another story about old Harry. Years before the mountain blew, Another famous Washingtonian who became the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. Anyone guess wh who I'm, I'm talking about? Who was it now? From Yakima, Washington, do you know? Chief Justice William O. Douglas had climbed nearly every major mountain when he was 11 years of age. Some of you may or may not know. And by the way, if you haven't read a biography or two of William O. Douglas, native of Yakima, you need to do it. When he was a very small child, he contracted poliomyelitis, and his legs were withered and twisted, and it was thought that he would never be able to walk rightly or correctly and certainly not run, but his mother began, as any mother would, to work on his legs, to massage his legs, and to go walking with him. And he'd go limping along as just a little boy. And his mother, each week, would take him on a little further journey and a little further journey, and then she began to encourage him with his friends to go back up into the Cascades, the east side of the Cascades, though, those that are west of the city of Yakima. And by the time he was 11 years of age, he was going on three and four day campouts, sometimes alone, way back up in the Cascades. And he climbed nearly all of the highest peaks. And then he began to climb and study the Wallawa Mountains. In fact, he said of all the places he did climb, including great mountains over in Switzerland, the Wallawas were his favorite, and he had purchased a little property back up a certain Wallawa Canyon and built there a little cabin. He had gone fishing here at Spirit Lake, or he had gone in with the intention to fish, I should better say, and he stopped in at old Harry Truman's lodge and purchased some fishing gear, some tackle, and purchased a fishing license. 
He happened to be wearing on that day something that was customary for him when he was out hiking the mountains and camping, a khaki shirt and khaki shorts above the knee and a straw hat. And he strolls into Harry Truman's establishment and he says, I'd like to buy this. And he made his purchases and Harry said nothing. And then he said, sir, do you have any suggestions where I might catch a few trout? Any certain place that you would recommend? And old Harry looked him up and down. And he said, I can't imagine a sissy like you catching anything anywhere. <laughs> and Supreme Court Justice wasn't one to be backed down easily or he wouldn't become what he had become. And so he kind of bristled and, and uh, gave it right back. And at that time, old Harry Truman said, you get the out of my joint and don't you come back here, you. And then he used some unkind words. And so Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas turned, went out through the door and started down the pathway toward his car. And one of Mr. Truman's friends said to him, Harry, do you have any idea whom you've just kicked out of the joint? He said, no, I don't. And furthermore, I don't care. But he said, perhaps you ought care. You have just kicked out Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas. And they said, old Harry's jaw dropped. Oh, no, he said. And he went running out and hollering after him, excuse me, sir, please excuse me. And he apologized all over himself. And he said, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to take you fishing. And uh, the justice said, all right, sir, we could be friends. And believe it or not, they became pen pals. And they wrote together up until the time of William O. Douglas' death. They were pen pals. So that's just a little bit of the character of old Harry Truman who lived up here and decided he was going to die here as well. Now this was one of the eruptions before the great blow. This is a little bit of a picture of the cone style of the original volcano, the typical volcano, I should better say. And by the way, we here in the Pacific Northwest are circled around with them. You know that, of course. And beyond that, what is known as the Pacific Rim, which includes some um, those many places around the Indian Ocean are just pockmarked with live but inactive volcanoes. Some are active, some become active, and then go dormant for a while, but we're in the volcano part of the world. Indeed, we are. And so it was thought that the volcano would blow right out through the top. It had some steam vents off to the sides, as you can see, that released a little pressure, but it was not to be that way with this mountain. On May 18, 8.32 in the morning, 1980, David O. Johnston from his camp set up five miles on the north face, got on his two-way radio and shouted into the microphone, Vancouver, this is it. Vancouver, this is it. And he was blasted into outer space. He was incinerated from a distance of five miles. And the mountain began an eruption that would soon blacken the sun. This was an eruption that could easily be seen from satellites in outer space. Now, this is a little bit of a diagram. The dotted line there is what the mountain was before the explosion. Right up there, the summit, a little above uh, 9,600, false summit over here, they say 9,677 feet. And it was a bit higher than that over here toward the south rim. And this is the hole that was blown out in that explosion. Those who've done the studies say that this mountain blew out one square mile of rock, ash, and lava. That means we build a fence that is a mile this way and a mile that way, a mile this way, a mile back this way, and then it is one mile high. And we fill that crib, if you please, with rocks and ash and lava, and that's how much was blown out of this mountain. In terms of the timber that was blown down, more than one billion board feet in that first initial blast. 
It was something awesome. It may be that some of your relatives were logging up in the area, or maybe they went up to do some of the logging afterward. I don't know. I do know very well that when I was working over along the Columbia River a few years ago, I had the privilege to baptize a man who was cutting logs a little bit south from Mount St. Helen, just up above the Columbia River, and he said, my ears are still ringing, and I can still feel the heat. It was awesome. It was earth-shaking, but it wasn't the greatest event the world would ever know. Now this, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, is a picture from outer space. A picture taken from a satellite at the time of the explosion, about three minutes after the initial blow. Peggy and I were living at the time, if you can follow my pointer, right over here toward the right and center of the screen. This is the state of Idaho, of course. And we were living right there, just north from Boise in Garden Valley. And we were fearful that some of that ash that was blown out might uh, settle on our house. It, it, might, uh, it might cause the decks to cave in. You never knew how much was going to settle or really exactly where. And uh, we were pretty sure it was going to kill the lawn. There was nothing we could do about it. But we were working, as I've said a bit ago, over in Denver, Colorado. By the following morning, 28 hours after the initial explosion, I went out to our car parked on the west side of Denver, and I scraped off of the windshield and the hood enough of that ash to fill a matchbox. I have it somewhere still. When we made our trip up here, we scooped up more of it, and I had the opportunity to take it between my fingers and to rub. It looked like talcum powder, but when you rubbed it just a little bit, it quickly took the edges off of your fingers, and it would trim your fingernails. It was a grit that uh, looked very, very fine and very powdery, but in reality was not. How many of you had some of it in your yard? You had it on your rooftop. Yeah, you sure remember. How much was there here? As much as a foot in places or more or less? Yeah, about that much? That's my recollection of this part of the state of Washington. Around a foot, some places more. And there was a great worry here in the fruit growing areas, over around Brewster and south from there, and over in uh, the Yakima Valley, and over in... Uh, in the area around Walla Walla, there was a fear that it would destroy the crops. But we discovered later that there was something nutritive about it. There was an apple bumper crop that next fall after the explosion. And so it's curious what happens. But in any event, not one drop, not one least bit of ash fell on our home over here, but the force blew that material way up into the stratosphere, way up into the atmosphere, and the jet stream caught it and took it over the Rocky Mountains and deposited a lot of it on the other side. So you didn't get all of it, not by any means. I can remember so very well, however, watching on television what was going on here and in Spokane and elsewhere, how the state troopers were going into the equipment shops, going into the mechanics, and they were putting those great big truck breathers on the sides of the car. And, and the trucks and the trains had to, uh, to put some kind of special breathing apparatus so that that stuff wouldn't be sucked inside the engines and it would cut the rings they set out of an engine in just a matter of a few revolutions. It was something else, wasn't it now? Well, the picture from outer space. Now, this is the aftershot. This is from near the camp of David Johnson, those five miles to the north where he thought he was perfectly safe but the mountain blew out from the north side. Didn't go out through the top as had been expected, but rather blew out from the north face. We're going to see the crater now. They tell me, and I know it's true because not too very long I flew over it. Our jet went right over so we could have a look down inside. And I know that that bulge, that cone is growing. It's much larger than what you see it here again. And from time to time, it puffs out a little bit again. It's not gone to sleep entirely, not by any means. This is looking down into the fire hole about three days afterward. This was taken, by the way, by a very brave helicopter pilot. There's no way in the world you'd have gotten me <laughs> to fly inside there just a few hours after the thing had blown. But you can see the fire down in the fire hole there still. Now this, ladies and gentlemen, is the timber. Reminded me of being in a pet shop after they'd clipped a half a dozen dogs and 14 cats. This is big timber. Douglas fir and other varieties of evergreens. It was thought surely that uh, it would be a waste, but the loggers moved in 
and they had to pay big money to get anyone to go in there to cut the logs initially. If any of you have ever cut logs, and I have, you know of the danger when one is bent a little bit and in a spring-like effect, and nearly all of these were, and lots of the loggers gave their lives. And more than that, they had to change their chains. There was a crew, by the way, of folk who were paid a little less money to go in and to chop a ring around the base of the trees. They had to cut not uh, only those that were blown down, but those who were still standing if they had been ringed and encircled by the ash. And we're going to see some that were affected in just that way. They had to chop that away down to the to the core of the tree, get the bark off and away, and still yet, that grit would dull a chainsaw after three or four cuts, and they'd either have to sharpen or completely change the, uh, the chain on the chainsaw. Now, this is a logging camp seven miles away, ladies and gentlemen, and it looks like a little kid's plate box, doesn't it? It looks like the sandbox, maybe, but these are huge, huge off-road log trucks. Did you see them here? They've been blown away. There are the trailers over there, and the trucks blown and rolled. There's a gravel truck where they've been putting gravel on the roads here, and this will help you to get a little bit of a feeling for the size of the timber and the logs in this log yard. Amazing. There's an airplane flying over the north side a few days after the blow. There were fascinating stories, but there were also tragic stories. And during the lecture, we may say more about that as time allows, but some of you folks may remember the story that was involved around this pickup. There was a man who'd taken his two little boys for the weekend to go camping up near the mountain. They wanted to go up to be close to where she was puffing and steaming, and they paid the ultimate price. They said when they got inside to where their remains were, it was as if they had been baked inside a microwave oven for about an hour. Sixty folks lost their lives. The fortunate thing, I think not just fortunate, but miraculous, in which we can again see the hand of God, the miraculous thing was that it happened early on a Sunday morning. Had it happened on any other weekday, there would have been many more loggers and woodsmen and forest service folks out in and around the area, and the loss of life would have surely been far, far greater. There is a machine like Lyle operated for about six years. That's a big link belt log loader. We called them the jammer. And you can see it's over on its side. Well, it's not only over on its side. It was blown about 175 feet from where it had been sitting before. They talk about the power of tornadoes. Nothing compared to this. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the Toodle River. The Toodle River was filled with logs because... When the explosion happened, it melted the eternal snows on the sides, mostly the north, but also on the west side of Mount St. Helens. Instantly it melted, and the water ran down, and there came a flood down the Toodle and the Cowlitz as well, and it picked up from the log camps these logs, and they went down through the river and began to hit those bridges like battering rams. And I can still, in my mind's eye, see the television pictures of the people who were standing on the bridge looking over you know they want to be there to you go close up and personal and any moment you know the bridge is going to be smashed to bits and they're going to be washed out into the <laughs> amazing <laughs> nothing like seeing it firsthand is there yeah i have a guess some of those folks were from idaho I'm not real sure. Now, this is what it was like when a few days after the explosion, Peggy and I and our friends and our buddy, our boy went up there. Look at those trees. Now, we're looking up about 12 feet here. And by the way, we're about uh, 14 miles downstream the Toodle. We're a long ways from where the explosion happened. And there you see that white line. That was the high mark of the ash and the lava and the snow melt in the water. There's old Troy. That's our baby boy, and this was even further on down. And there, by the way, is one of those rings that they chopped around the bottom so they could put the power saws in and be able to fall those trees. They had to cut them if they had been encircled around with that ash because they were going to die. The, the nutrients were sealed off. The air was sealed off to the base roots, and they were going to die. There's Troy picking up some of that ash that I mentioned to you a bit ago. 
and uh, rubbing it between his fingers. Well, our then president, Jimmy Carter, came out and uh, flew over the place. And then he said, and I shall never forget, it reminded me of the pictures that I had seen of the soft landings on the moon. It reminded me of moonscapes. By the way, would any of you folks recognize this little lady here? Who is that? That's Dixie Lee Ray, your governor at the time, of course. And a good one she was. <laughs> I heard a couple of you laugh. I heard you. Well, this is downstream. Downstream many, many miles. And this is when the mountain first began to explode and event. And then she darkened the sky. And a lot of the folks thought, this is it. This is the end. And it was for some. I remember reading about folks who were camped just upstream a little ways from here who jumped in their campers, left their picnic supplies, left their water hoses, jumped in their campers to make an escape. And I remember very well one man saying, I took those 45 and 50 mile an hour curves at 65, 70, and perhaps sometimes as fast as 80 miles an hour. And he said, I barely outran our friends who were behind us. They didn't make it. We made it. Amazing. Amazing. The awesome power. They said it was akin, they believed, to the explosion of 50 Hiroshima bombs. Remarkable. I want to thank you for traveling with me. En route here from Arizona where we were doing evangelism, Peggy and I came up Highway 93 through Nevada. We spent the night near Wells, Nevada, a cold night. Next morning we got up early and drove on into Boise, Idaho. We were home just a couple of days and there came the announcement that you folks probably remember hearing that at Wells, Nevada there had been an earthquake. And they'd had to shut down the school and certain other civil buildings and auditoriums because of broken pipelines and some downed electricity. Places we've never imagined before. Earthquakes, tsunamis. And so we've entitled our remarks for this evening, Earthquakes, Tsunamis, Shake, Rattle, and Roll. Back in the rock and roll era, that was a fun expression, but it's not so much anymore as we're going to see. I want you, if you will, please now to open your Bibles with me to Revelation chapter 6. We're going to, from the book of Revelation, begin with several scriptures. So leave a bookmark here, and we're going to notice many, many scriptures as we begin our study. Remember now that we have said every evening, I believe, that the book of Revelation is not the last book of the Bible by accident, but it's for those who live in the last days, in the end times. And so we begin at chapter 6, you and I, and with the 12th verse, and then we shall move from there. Revelation chapter 6 and verse 12. I looked, and then he opened the sixth seal, and there was a great... Now you tell me what it says. All right, I'm glad that you have your Bibles and, and you're following along. If you don't have a Bible, we'll be glad to, to give you one. It's very important that we see this with our own eyes and read it from our Bibles and even memorize some of these verses. I looked when he opened the sixth seal and there was a terrible, a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth of hair and the moon was turned to blood. Now we're going to go over just a couple of chapters, Revelation chapter 8, and we're going to read verse 5, and we're going to see a similarity here. And these are all last day prophecies, end time events. Revelation chapter 8 and verse 5. Then that angel took the censer, and he filled it with fire from off the altar, and he cast it into the earth. And there were voices, and there were thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake. There it is again. Let's go to chapter 11, shall we? Just a page or two away now. Over to chapter 11, and we're going to notice verses 13 and 19. Revelation chapter 11, verses 13 and 19. At about the same hour, there was a great, there it is, it was a great earthquake, and a fourth part of the city fell as a result of that great earthquake. And there were men who were slain, many by the thousands, and many were affrighted. And they looked at the glory of the God of heaven. And then we drop down now, you and I, to verse 18. 
And we read these words, verses 18 and 19. The nations were angry. God's wrath had come. And the time of the dead that they ought to be judged. And that you should reward your servants, the prophets, and the saints, and all those that fear your name, small and great. And that you would destroy those who destroyed the earth. And then verse 19, the temple of God was suddenly opened in heaven and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament and there were lightnings and there were voices and thunderings and there was an earthquake and there was great hail. Now chapter 16, as we move on toward the end and near to the last days, Revelation chapter 16 and we're going to notice together verse 18. Revelation 16, beginning to read now at verse 18. There were voices, there were thunderings, and there were lightnings, and there was a great earthquake like there had never been since men were upon the earth, an earthquake so mighty or so great. I'm going to share with you briefly my own experience in and with and around earthquakes. It was only just a few weeks before Peggy and I were married. And by the way, for those of you who may be wondering, this is not the history of civilization, all right? This isn't uh, the ancient history of the world. Or not, not so long ago, I was standing on a certain street corner in Payot, Idaho. It was a wonderful summer evening, early July. Some friends of mine had driven up, rolled down their window, and I was leaning in and talking through when suddenly I began to feel as if I'd become drunken and I knew there was no reason for that. I looked up and there was a street light and the street light was swinging and I looked over and the telephone poles were swinging and then I knew that I was experiencing my very first earthquake. This, by the way, in 1960 was the earthquake that killed a lot of folks who were camped over in Yellowstone and changed the face of that park in many, many ways. Much more recently and closer in place as well as time, Peggy and I were doing evangelism over in the greater Seattle area. And we decided one afternoon that we were going to go down to Olympia to an RV store and look at awnings for a motorhome. We did just that. We had parked our car and left Peggy's little dog inside up in the back window. And parked next to us were three or four of those motorhomes that are about a half a block long and cost a million bucks. You know what I'm talking about? All right. So we were inside now and up against the wall were the awnings and we were looking at them and looking at colors and a man came up and said, uh, are, are these within your price range? And I said, no. <laughs> and, and, and then he said, do you hear that? Do you hear that? And you've heard folks describe the hurricanes and the tornadoes before, haven't you? Like a freight train was coming and some others have said like a jet engine that was taking off. We began to hear this roar and I knew instantly what it was. And the man that was there with us said, maybe we ought to go run stand in the doorway of the bathroom. I said, maybe we ought to run outside into the parking lot. And that's exactly what we did. And we went out to where our car was. And I have a problem with motion sickness in any event. And here I am leaning up against the trunk, hanging on for dear life, reminding myself of old Fred G. Sanford, you know. Here I come, Elizabeth. You hear that, honey? And our dog was on the other side of the window, and his eyes were this big, and he was asking, what are you doing? And those huge motorhomes that were parked next to us were rolling backward and forward about 12 feet, they said. When we got back to our motorhome, we discovered cans on the floor, and one of our sliding doors was off its hinges, but no serious damage. When that one happened, and how many of you were in it? Were any of you? Yeah, here, folks, that you were in it. You were there, of course. And so this is very clear in your minds. When this one happened, my sister's youngest son, Todd, was in the top of Seattle's second highest building where he had an, a corner office. He is a computer genius, and he'd helped build a company there. He was at his desk in the corner and up about 30-some uh, stories, I believe, and he said his building, in comparison to those around it, was swaying, it seemed like, 30 feet. And then he said, I looked at the building directly across from me, and there were two poor guys who were on one of those frames washing the windows. You hear that, Elizabeth? <laughs> I'm afraid to get on a ladder now for fear an earthquake will come. 
<laughs> and so that has been my personal experience with one little exception that I'll get to after a bit. I want you now to open your Bibles, please, to Matthew chapter 24. We've said on prior evenings that Luke chapters 17 and 21, together with Matthew 24, are Jesus' sermons on the last day events. The disciples have asked him, Lord, what's it going to be like just before you come back? Tell us. And Jesus said it's going to be like this and like this and this and this and this. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 7. Here Jesus, speaking of the very last day, says, Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in many different places. Now the original language, the New Testament language is here saying that in the last days there are going to be earthquakes where folks have never known them before, never heard of them before. They, they've just not been used to them before. It is an unusual, a very strange phenomenon. Earthquakes in different places. Now we're going to go over to Luke chapter 21. This is Jesus' continuation on that very same subject. Lord, what's it going to be like? And Jesus said, it's going to be like this and this and this. And when you see these things, he said, then know the end is very near. I'm going to take up the reading at verse 11. Luke chapter 21 and verse 11. The same theme. Great earthquakes shall be in different places, famines and pestilences and fearful sights and great signs there shall be from the heavens as well. Nearly every week I meet someone who says, well, I think you're putting too much emphasis here. I, I think you're going to be overboard. I think you're kind of a calamity howler. And not so very long ago, by the way, and uh, to my own heart's sorrow, I read uh, a Christian magazine that suggested we really ought not to place any uh, undue concern on these signs, whether they're wars or rumors of wars or earthquakes or signs in the heavens, for the end is not yet. And what we ought to do is, is just to have peace and faith in the coming of Jesus. But Jesus said, when you see these things begin, then you know it's time to get ready. And so I think it's more than uh, of casual importance that we look and that we study. It's very vitally important, my dears, that we know this book. It's more important, however, that we know its author. And when we conclude each evening, we turn our eyes upon Jesus. We must always conclude in that way. But there are those who say, well, it's always been like this. I mean, my great, great, great grandfathers, I mean, the Native Americans wrote about the earthquakes and, and in story form, they've passed it down generation, generationally. It's always been, it's just the same as it's always been. No, no. Well, we're going to read a warning from God in 2 Peter. It's time for us to turn together now to 2 Peter, and we're going to read from chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. 2 Peter, the second chapter. Verses 3 and 4, God in his omniscience, in his all-knowing mind, knew that this very thing was going to happen, that folks are going around saying, don't worry about it, it's always been like this, never any different from this, why ever since the forebear, since our, all right, let's read it. Knowing this first, Second Peter chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, knowing this first, there shall come in the, which times, huh? Yeah, not the days of the pioneers. In the last days, there shall come scoffers who are falling after their own lusts. And they're saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, things have continued since they were from the very beginning of creation. No worse than it's ever been. Ah, but wait a minute. We read last night from Isaiah, and UA students will want to now put it in your notes again. Isaiah chapter 51 and verse 6. There God describing the world in its end time condition said, the earth will wear out, wear, will wear out like an old garment. It'll, it'll wear out like an old coat that you've worn winter after winter until it's become threadbare. Now, with that in mind, here are the facts regarding earthquakes. From 1970 to the year 2000, Disasters, natural, affected more people than in the prior thousands of years. But well, we don't go back thousands in our view of the Bible, but hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, we certainly do. Natural disasters from 1970 till 2000 moved from 70 million, 1970, 
around 70 million to over 200 million in just 30 years, a little over. Since 1900, ladies and gentlemen, there have been 578 earthquakes that measured six point or more on the Richter scale, and they say somewhere around five and a half is a major earthquake. That is something to take note of. That's something that's going to rattle your, uh, your uh, cupboards and, and spill your coffee. In California alone, there were 475 earthquakes along the San Andreas Fault. I believe, ladies and gentlemen, and we'll study this further on another evening, that God sent a great earthquake to announce the end times in the last days. And we're going to go back to Revelation chapter 6 and reread a verse that we used just a little bit ago, and we're going to see it in its true end time context. Revelation chapter 6 and verse 12. This happens to be, by the way, the context of the seven last events, the four horsemen and the seven seals. Chapter 6. And reading verse 12, I looked when he opened the sixth seal and looked, there was a great earthquake and the sun became as black as sackcloth of hair and the moon became as blood. Back about 1780, this thing happened and a short time thereafter, there was the dark day and the bloody moon and God used this earthquake to announce the end times. Now, by the way, in the Bible, there is a vast difference between the last days singular and the last, I'm sorry, the last days plural and the last day singular. There is a vast difference. And I'll say once more, I believe and have for a long while that we moved into the end times, plural, the last days, plural, back about 1780. And as we study further, we shall enlarge upon that on subsequent evenings, as we've already mentioned. The epicenter of this terrible earthquake was Lisbon, Portugal. Now, there have been earthquakes that killed more people. There was one over in China in modern time that we believe killed as many as a million folks. But uh, the difference between the Lisbon earthquake and others, uh, the Lisbon earthquake, we believe, killed somewhere around 90,000 people only. But that's a lot. and That's enough, isn't it? All right. That's enough. The vast difference between the Lisbon, Portugal earthquake and others, perhaps in China that killed more folks, was that the Lisbon earthquake shook fully one-fourth of the surface of planet Earth. All of the British Isles were shaken. All of the western half of Europe, from the, from the far side of the Mediterranean Sea, the north of the continent of Africa, one-fourth of the surface of planet Earth was terribly shaken by this earthquake. And then soon thereafter, there was the dark day and the bloody moon and a meteoric shower like there had never been before. Between 1890 and 1900, ladies and gentlemen, there was only just one major earthquake. And by that I mean somewhere around six point on the scale. But now there are thousands of them every week on a worldwide base. Yeah, times have changed. Things have not continued as they were at the time of our fathers. There's a metaphor that I have used for the last 35 years, and I think it's best understood by mothers. It's uh, first described in Isaiah chapter 13, and we ought to read it. We have the time. Let's go there together. It's important, I think, that we see some of these scriptures for ourselves and that I don't only just allude to them. Isaiah chapter 13. Isaiah was a major prophet, of course, and God spoke to him about end-time events. Isaiah, just before Jeremiah, and we're going to notice at chapter 13, verses 6 and 7 and 8. Isaiah chapter 13. Howl ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It'll come as a great destruction from the Almighty. Therefore shall all hands be faint, and men's hearts melt. They're going to be afraid. Pangs of sorrow shall take hold of them, and they shall be in pain as a woman that travails. They shall be amazed at one another, and their faces shall be as flames. Now, by the way, you read that same illustration in Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 24, and in Jeremiah chapter 22 and verse 23, Jeremiah 22, 23, the same illustration of uh, the end time events being likened to a woman who's about to give birth. And then you find the Apostle Paul taking up that theme and quoting from Isaiah in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1, 2, and 3, as a woman about to give birth. Now, this then is the point. You mothers know 
And some of you men know because you've had the privilege to go in. How many of you men were able to go in and watch your baby be born? That means that you live in the modern world. And, and our old doctor wouldn't let me go to see our babies be born. And, and I was cleaned up. The labor pains come near and near together. The contractions in terms of intensity grow stronger and stronger and stronger and the pain is greater and greater. And I must say that I certainly admire the ladies who still insist on having it, having the baby without any kind of anesthesia or spinal block. I've, uh, I've been underneath a log truck but I've had nothing like the birth of a baby. I've been told at least by a girl that probably knows earthquakes to signal the last great events on planet Earth. Now I want to just take your minds to the way and time that God has used earthquakes to announce great events. Matthew chapter 25 verse 50 and following says that when Jesus died on a cross there was a great earthquake. He shouted with a loud voice and there was a great earthquake. And then it says in Matthew chapter 28, verse 2, that when Jesus three days later came out of the grave, there was a great earthquake. And this great earthquake was so intense that it wakened some of the dead that were in the graveyard, in the cemetery around about him, and they came back. Some people believe that those folks who came alive in that earthquake were taken to heaven with Jesus when 40 days later he ascended. We're going to have to wait a while, I suppose, to find out. When it was time for the gospel to go to the Gentiles, God sent a great earthquake. And you read about it in Acts chapter 16 and verse 26. And the context, of course, finds the apostle Paul and Silas in jail over in a little town by the name of Philippi. And Gordon, you'll be interested in this. That means the town where they loved horses. Philippi. Yeah. The word Philip, the name Philip means one who loves horses. All right. When the time came to send the gospel to the Gentiles, God sent an earthquake. And God, he says in the Revelation, chapter 6, verse 12 especially, he would send a great earthquake to announce the last days, the final end. Now, I want to talk to you for just a short while about some of the major earthquake faults here in the United States. And we'll start over on the other side, and then we'll work our way toward the west. Manhattan Island, they say, is on an earthquake fault. I'd not want to be up in the Trump Towers. I'd not want to be up on the top of the Empire State Building as I once was if that should happen. Manhattan is on an earthquake fault. One of the largest faults, second largest, they say, is the New Madrid Fault of Missouri. And if you look for it on a map, by the way, you're going to find it right down at what they call the Four Corners. That's where Missouri, Arkansas, Kentucky, and Tennessee come together. And the, the thing erupted. It, it shook, this earthquake several years ago and there was a guy back there that was in the middle of it he was lost and took him three or four days to find his way out and when he came out they found him still with his coonskin cap can you imagine who that was davy davy crockett exactly he was in the new madrid earthquake and they say one day she's going to spring loose again and then there's the San Andreas Fault of California, and most of us out in the West, at least, hear quite a lot about that. Uh, she goes off many, many times now every single day. The largest earthquake on the North American continent, ladies and gentlemen, is the Cascadia earthquake, which runs from Northern California up through to British Columbia, Canada. It runs from about 14 miles to 50 miles off the Pacific coast. That means it's in our backyard. The Cascadia Fault. Volcanoes, you probably know, are the result of, um, of earthquakes and, and those faults and those tectonic plates that push together. And the Pacific Rim is, rim is lined with the volcanoes, as we mentioned a bit ago. Therefore, also, in this part of the world, we have more earthquakes than they know elsewhere, certainly out on the Hawaiian, Hawaiian Islands and the Philippines and all around the Indian Ocean. I want to mention to you briefly now some of the earthquakes here in the Pacific Northwest. There is Glacier Peak. Some of these, by the way, are inactive and have been for a long while. 
Others of them are active in some what they call semi-active. Glacier Peak here in the northwest. And then Mount Baker up in the Washington and the British Columbia border. And then Mount Rainier. And then Mount Adams. And then Mount Helens. And then the Three Sisters of Oregon. And Mount Hood. And Mount Newberry. And Crater Lake. And Jefferson Mountain. And Shasta Mountain in California. And Lassen Mountain. And Garibaldi Mountain. Quite a few of them around, huh? We talked during the travelogue about Mount St. Helens and its eruption on May 18 at 8.32 in the morning in 1980 and about David Johnston shouting into the microphone, Vancouver, this is it, this is it. Now I'm going to read to you and you'll forgive me for reading, but it's far better said than I could say it and I think it's important that we read it. And so I'm going to read to you now about Cascadia. This fall is 680 miles long and it runs from central California clear up the Pacific coast and out onto Vancouver Island, British Columbia. Plates move at a relative rate of about 10 millimeters per year at a somewhat oblique angle to the subduction zone, uh, zone rather, the subduction zone. Because of the very large fault area, the Cascadia subduction zone can produce very large earthquakes with a magnitude of nine point or even greater if a rupture occurred over this whole area. When the locked zone stores up energy for an earthquake, the transition zone then, although somewhat plastic, can suddenly and without warning rupture. Unlike, unlike most subduction zones worldwide, there is along the Cascadia no real oceanic trench that's present along the continental margin of Cascadia. Instead, there are terraces. There's an accretionary ledge that has been uplifted to form a series of coasts and exotic mountains out in the Pacific. A high rate of sedimentation from the outflow of three major rivers, the Frazier, the Columbia, and the Klamath, which cross the Cascade Range, contributes to further obscuring the presence of this trench. However, in common with most other subduction zones, the outer margin is slowly but surely being compressed, similar to that of the tightening of a giant spring. When this stored energy is suddenly released by slippage across the fault at irregular intervals, the Cascadia subduction zone could create a very large earthquake with a magnitude of nine or more. There have been 11 eruptions of the Cascadia zone in the past 4,000 years, seven in just the last 200 years, but the big one is still out there. Even as death and destruction and to uh, and um, the death and destruction toll from the tsunami that struck the Southeast Asia a few weeks ago continues to mount, and by the way, it killed around 300,000 we now know. The potentiality of the Cascadia Fault t is that of taking far, far greater life. And then they go on to tell how along the Oregon coast they're now putting up signs of danger over in Seaside and on down the coast because there are places on the 101 highway where there is not a high enough area to get out. And they further say that if this one ever releases, when the spring goes, we're going to have a warning of only 15 seconds. 15 seconds, and the wave that is going to, the wave, by the way, of the tsunami that was out in the Southeast Asia, that wave was 30 feet high. They say this one is going to be from 50 to 200 feet high. And San Francisco, and you go on up to British Columbia, Canada, and you can see what could and what will happen. Isaiah chapter 2, verses 19, uh, 20 and 21. God says in the last day, I will arise and shake terribly the earth. The only question tonight is, are our priorities in order? Are you studying and praying? Are you witnessing? Are you talking to your kids and your spouses, and your neighbors? Are you attending church and prayer meeting? Now, I'm going to get very practical with you here. Hebrews chapter 10, 24 and 25, speaking about the last days, says that we ought not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, especially as you see the end time approaching. We're going to need to draw strength from one another. It's time to come to church, not only on worship morning, but on Wednesday night as well. God is giving us the warning. It's time to get ready. In Psalm 46, verses 1, 2, and 3 there we, though, have God's promise. I will be your refuge and strength. I'll be a present help in the time of need. You need not fear, though the earth moves and the mountains are cast into the sea, though the waters roar 
and the mountains shake. And so we Christians need to come together to worship together and be here for prayer meeting and sing lustily and loudly together on Christ the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. When Jesus comes, there shall be an earthquake that will waken the dead in Christ. And those who've died with their faith in Jesus are going to come out and breathe the breath of eternal life. Instead of fearing this one, I've come to long for it. For a few weeks ago, Peggy and I put our boy in a cemetery in eastern Oregon. And soon, there'll come the quake and the voice that says, awake, time to get up. And we, who are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them to meet our Lord in the air. And so shall we always be with our Lord. Let's pray. Let not your hearts be troubled. You promised. You believe in God. Believe also in me. I'm coming. coming with a shout, with a trumpet blast, with the greatest natural collision, calamity that the world has ever known. The saints will gather round the ruins, the open graves, where the loved ones have come back to eternal life and shout hallelujah. Even so, come Lord Jesus, amen.